Hi, everyone. It's John. I just wanted to say happy holidays. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. Uh, thank you to all the subscribers, all the viewers. And um, I also want to do a special shout out to one of the subscribers, uh, Jamie in Albany, Georgia, who gave me this beautiful hand painted ornament. Um, it's just gorgeous. And I just want to say thank you, Jamie. It meant a, a great deal to me. Um, also, if you ever want to reach me or send me anything, how you know what, whatever works, um, my address is John Cato, and that's P.O. Box 3244, Manhattan Beach, California, 90266. Or you can email me at that's classic TV at gmail.com. Um, anyway, here we go with John Davidson, a legendary performer. He was amazing. And um, little secret, he will be back. We will be doing another one with him. But enjoy this. He's got some great stuff in there. All right. Have a great holiday. Okay. Well, today on That's Classic, uh, we have somebody that I, I have to tell you, I, I feel like I saw him constantly, constantly during the 60s, 70s, and 80s on television. And uh, we have none other than John Davidson. Uh, and uh, John, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, John. Uh, this is a, a crazy time of year with Christmas coming and all. I don't know when this is going to air. Are, are, are we live? I don't even know. No, but... no, no, no. We're not live. No, I'm recording it. And honestly, I'm not sure when I'll when I'll release it as soon as you know, but uh, probably uh, within the month. Yes. Okay. Uh, but it is a it, it's a holiday time of year and everybody's busy and I, I've been sick. I had this upper respiratory thing that's been going around. So um I'm glad we could do this today, and hi, great to be on your show. <laughs> well, I appreciate you being on. I, I John had to cancel once, and he's he's back, and I, I can't I can't thank you enough for coming on. And obviously, I hope you you do completely get over this. But um, so I'll tell you what, out of the gates, I wanted to say you were on the Johnny Carson show 87 times. I saw. Um, can you say anything about that? Like, how was you know Johnny? We hear mixed things about and. I just would love to hear your take on what what that was all, you know, like. Oh, man, I, I don't know what mixed things you've heard, but uh, man, it was such a privilege. And, and he was just so supportive of me and such a I can't say he was a good friend because uh, I didn't really know him. I don't think Ed McMahon knew him very well or, or wow. even Doc. Uh, he was a very private man, very private and and. Uh, and shy, I think. I think he was socially um, um, self-protective, I have to say it that way. Although mm -hmm. I, I never actually, I, I, I did see him at one party at uh, at, uh, at, a, at a house. Uh, but uh, uh, I mostly just saw him on the air. I would see him in makeup before the show when I was guest when I was guesting with him, uh, and he would say, "Hi, John. Nice to have you back." And uh, he he liked to save it all for the air, you know, to have that excitement of, well, it's, haven't seen a lot of being that excitement. And he certainly was a wonderful, uh, very funny man, wonderful entertainer, and a good interviewer. And uh, but he was uh, shy. He mm -hmm. started as a magician, and I think that says a lot. Uh, you can picture him in the schoolyard in sixth grade, you know, trying to walk up to girls and say, "Pick a card, pick a card," you know, let me show you a trick, you know, <laughs> just some. In other words, he, he, I think he used magic uh, to communicate with people. And uh, that's what shy people do. They, they want to get a wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one way of doing it. I was very shy as a kid, so I can relate to that. Um, but yeah, Ooh. Carson, Carson oh. was very supportive and a, just a great man, great gentleman. Yeah. And what, uh, by the way, I, you know, you mentioned Ed and Doc, I, who I didn't even, you know, really thought when I was asking you that, but what were what were they like? I guess off camera. Um, Ed, uh, well, Doc Doc was the most human to to me. Uh, Ed was wonderful. They were all very very nice. But uh, uh, Doc and I wound up in San Miguel de Allende uh, years later. He he lived in in Mexico as I did for uh, eight or nine years uh, uh, from 2004 to 2011. Um, he he. Uh, Yes, you know, he's still performing and playing. Yeah, he's in his yeah. 90s. He, he practices like two hours a day to keep to keep his uh, lip perfect. Wow. As I try, I try to sing every day. I, I, I 
I love it when I'm singing well. And that's why having this little bit of respiratory thing, um, I get very depressed when I can't sing. I love to make a vocal sound. It just makes me feel like that's what I'm supposed to do. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I was, I guess, closest to Doc. Uh, but Ed was a good friend. Ed, Ed had such a dignity about him, as did Johnny, that is, was a little bit standoffish, but uh, not in a bad way. They were just private people. Mm hmm. Yeah, I get it. I get it. And you, uh, you started out. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I really, I, you know, read it, read on you, and I just from years. But you, you seem like a very, like, a, more of like maybe a spiritual person. But you grew up in like a very like religious household. Am I right on that? I did. <clears throat> yeah, my dad was a Baptist minister, and my mother an ordained Baptist minister as well. Northern Baptist. Those are the ones that can dance. And. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but but they never did. But uh, yeah, I was, I was a preacher's kid, so I, I came from that sort of uh, uh, conservative background. And then I got into theater arts and discovered theater people. And and uh, <clears throat> I when I went to college, I I thought about uh, being like my dad, being a preacher. So I took some philosophy courses and stuff, and and realized that I didn't really have a, a strong religious feeling. And and uh, I've never been really religious. I, I, I'm an atheist, and, and, and I've uh, mm -hmm. uh, declared that as of the last uh, 15, 20 years of being a group called Openly Secular, just uh -huh. to say, I just, uh, I'm just not religious. And, and uh, so, but I did come from that background. Yeah, it was a great, that was my springboard. <clears throat> Did did you uh, when you segued from that and I, I I think you went out to New York uh, if I'm not mistaken here if I'm not you know obviously let me know but you worked uh, you worked in some pretty amazing uh, productions I mean I, I saw that you know you have this background you worked with Bert Lahr uh, and it was it Foxy and yes, uh, thanks it, um, I uh, graduated from college out in Ohio Denison University with a BA in theater arts. Got my degree just because my dad said you need a backup in case it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then I went to New York. Um, this was in the 60s, you know, gee. And I got a musical right away. Foxy with Bert Lahr. I played uh, Bert Lahr's, uh, oh, not his nephew, I guess. I played the part of a young college guy coming out to see my, my uncle. And uh, that's what I was. I was a college graduate and very clean cut and when I first got to New York in the 60s, I was very different because I was so clean cut. Oh, yeah, right. And, <clears throat> and I think that made me stand out. I wasn't Al Pacino or Robert De Niro or I wasn't uh, a street kid. I was uh, I was uh, from a, a very uh, conservative family. So I think that's how I got my start. And uh, then I went from a guy named Bob Banner, who had discovered Cal Burnett. <clears throat> discovered me on Broadway and brought me to television. So I started doing TV in the late 60s. Bob Banner was, uh, I mean, he sounds like he was instrumental. I mean, he, uh, I, I mean, it looks like he he literally like picked you out of the uh, the masses and, and created John Davidson. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. what, what, is that, am I adding too much to that? No, I got, I got very lucky that he, he saw me in the Broadway show and he, he said, I want to develop you as a singing entertainer. And I said, I just want to be on Broadway. I want to be uh, like Robert Goulet or, or, or uh, oh, Jerry Orbach was started on Broadway. Joel Gray started on Broadway. And I, I want to be like these broad, uh, Robert Preston and the music yeah, man. Sure. And, um, and he said, no, you can be everything. You can be a television variety host. You can, you can uh, do Shakespeare. You can do whatever. You don't just have to be in Broadway musicals. Wow. And so he said, you you should try to be a pitchfork instead of just a, a blade. Don't be just a, a, a spear, be a pitchfork. Many different ways of entertaining and telling stories. So he helped me to do a sort of broad career. And so I've uh, I've done, I have 12 albums and, and uh, I, I love, I play guitar and sing. I still do that now, but uh, I... He said, don't just do one thing. And that's, I guess that's why I still, uh, I'm 81 now and I'm still performing and, and uh, singing pretty well when I don't have this respiratory thing. Yeah. And uh, I, he said, you want to be a Swiss army knife. 
Wow. Not, not, not just a, a blade. So um, I've tried to do it all and it's, it's been an exciting life, been a lot of fun and I'm still doing it. Yeah. Did, was that when he said that to you, was it, was it natural for you to think, yeah, yeah, he's right. Or were you kind of like, actually, no, I just thought I was a theater guy. Yeah. Uh, it, it just broadened the whole thing. It made, it made work a lot harder. He said, you, he said, I, I'm going to help you develop a Las Vegas show. You're going to be a Las Vegas entertainer as well. And I said, no, I, I want to be just an actor on Broadway. So yeah. It, it made it a lot more work. Mm -hmm. um, and he made me realize this is a real profession. It's not just fooling around. It's not just doing what feels good. Um, you got to find a way to tell stories and entertain people uh, with many, many uh, things in your bag of tricks. And he said, that's the secret of some of the great careers like Sinatra and Bob Hope and Bing Crosby and, and uh, some of the careers that have, that have lasted a lifetime. Literally, um, so I, I was very lucky to have met Bob Banner. He did the same thing with Carol Burnett, and uh, Carol Burnett has had this sort of multifaceted thing. Yeah. You know? Were you? Uh, am I right? You were on the Carol Burnett show. Yeah. Yeah. He introduced me to. He introduced me to television uh, on a show called The Entertainers um, in the mid '60s, and then brought me to her show when she got her show on CBS, and um, I was the Andy Williams summer replacement in '66. Wow. Uh, re replaced Perry Como and, and Andy Williams. So that that got me my start. So people, I think it's a confusing career. I think sometimes people say, well, what is he? Yeah. In a game when Hollywood Squares uh, needed a new host, I was the second host of Hollywood Squares. Peter Marshall was the first and Tom Bergeron was after I did it. Yeah. And uh, I just, I kind of said yes to whatever people offered. Yeah. And uh, that's made it fun to always say yes. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Well, a couple of things there. Carol Burnett, uh, who I've always admired tremendously. What, what? I mean, she has also been known as just like one of the nicest people. Was she extremely, uh, you know, helpful to you? And and yes, yeah. She uh, she helped me with being funny. Uh, she set me up to be funny and. Um, she used to say to me, "Did you ever think in terms of an older woman?" You know, and she was old. <laughs> she's just a couple couple of years older than I. But uh, she, was, she was just such a lady, and uh, and uh, she, yeah, she she as I say, she introduced me on the entertainers, and then she brought me to her show uh, two or three times. Uh, at that time, I I didn't I couldn't do sketches. People like Steve, Law Steve Lawrence and other people could do sketches. And I, you know, Harvey Corman and Tim Conway were doing sketches. And I didn't, I didn't know how to get that sort of comedy going. I could do it now. And I, I really, uh, my, my show is very funny now. But uh, as a matter of fact, this season, funny thing you should mention, Carol Burnett, because uh, she is going to be introducing me at my little, I have a little place in Sandwich, New Hampshire uh -huh. called, called Club Sandwich. Very original. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right, right, right. I have a gift for the obvious. And uh, I sing there every Friday and Saturday. I've been starting in June for about five months a year. It's my third season. Wow. My first two, se two seasons were sold out because we only have 42 seats. Very small. Oh, my but gosh. I, sounds I, great. I, I sing with my guitar and my uh, and a bass player. And uh, but this year, and, and the lot, first two years, Tom Bergeron introduced me in at Club Sandwich on on video, on video every show. Wow! This year, this year, I called uh, Carol Burnett and I said, "Would you do a video introducing me?" And she said, "I'd love to." So oh, I haven't wow. got, I got. She just did it last week, so I'll, I'll be getting it, and uh, I'm very excited that she'll be introducing me once again, as she did 58 years ago. Oh my gosh, John, that's amazing. That really is. You now you went from there to um by the way, I do want to say one thing. You always well, first of all, look, my mother was a massive fan. Okay. That's why I mean that I, I literally remember you on our TV constantly, you know. And right. um, and so, but one thing that I always noticed about you is you always seem to be having fun. You always seem to be thankful. And 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 it's not something that I see in like everybody that you know, I, I see out there, but you always seem like you enjoyed the ride, you know, um, is that true? 
Um, no. Uh, yeah. I uh, early on I realized that when I do this, yeah, it it makes me feel better. Uh, makes me healthier to smile. But uh, and sometimes I lose the smile and and get uh, I can be very down and very melancholy and and get depressed. Sure. But. When I'm positive, it picks me up and it seems to work for me. Uh, early on, I realized that people can sing sad songs like, you know, crying in your beer songs, like who can I turn to when nobody needs me? Yeah. Uh, uh, songs about not being able to get the girl, about being a loser, whatever. It doesn't work for me because I think I look like a guy uh, who should be positive and and uh, uh -huh. so what works for me is to have positive passion and to be passionate about what I do um, I just found that that works in a way it's a trick it's a I mean it's a trick I've I've created this character of John Davidson which are the best parts of me I have parts of me that I'd rather not show you <laughs> <laughs> um, hey John I don't want to see all the parts no 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 <laughs> Um, but uh, so yeah, uh, you're uh, you're very intuitive to pick that out. That's what I've done. I, I think people like Dick Van Dyke have done the same thing. Have realized mm -hmm. that um, positive, do things with love and do things with positive passion. It just seems to help tell the story. No one wants to be around negative people. Well, I guess that's not true. Sometimes we do, don't we? But uh, that, yeah. that's the way I found that works. Yeah. I think that's I think that's great. I, I yeah, very intrigued. Um, the other thing, uh, I then you go from there. You go on to and and I may be jumping the ju jumping the shark, whatever, jumping jumping a bit. But uh, to happiest millionaire at Disney, I, I you know which which I recall. What what was that experience like? Obviously, that's Leslie Ann Warren too. Am I right on that? And then um, and, right. and Walt Disney had he. I, you were right on the cusp there. Had he passed already or was he still around? Well, you're right. That was right when I uh, did the Disney films. Uh, the, the Disney people saw me on a Bell Telephone Hour television show. And, uh, I, and I came out and screen tested at Disney in L.A. I was in New York. And um, uh, they signed me to a three-picture deal. This was right after Mary Poppins had just come out. It was written yeah. by the Sherman Sherman Brothers, and the Sherman Brothers also wrote the Happiest Millionaire and then one and only Genuine Original Family Band. Wow! And so I signed a three picture deal. We never did do the third one because uh, Happiest Millionaire and Family Band did not do as well as Mary Poppins. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was because, of course, it could couldn't have been my fault. Of I, course I, not. Jeff. Never mind. I got to blame somebody else. I, it it didn't have cartoons in it. Mary, Mary Poppins, mm -hmm. remember, had cartoons on the screen. Dick Van Dyke would dance with cartoons. Oh, yeah. Happy Smillion had no cartoons. had Fred McMurray and Tommy Steele. And Leslie M. Warren and I were the romantic couple. And then in Family Band, uh, one and only genuine original Family Band, we were also the romantic couple. So uh, Walt Disney was alive for Happy Millionaire. He called me John. I insisted that I called him Walt. It's very strange, really? but yeah. Good morning, Walt. Hi, John. <laughs> yeah. That's a thrill. That's a thrill. Oh yeah. Um, because he he changed uh, entertainment with in his life and creativity. Uh, but then he died. So one and only genuine original family band I did after Walt had gone, and it was a strange thing to be at the Disney studio during that time because. Everybody was walking around saying, what would Walt have done? Oh, my gosh. Which, which is not a good way to run a studio. Mm -hmm. They finally, you know, Michael Eisner came in and Disney got back on its feet. But it was an interesting time to be at Disney. And uh, I was very grateful for that experience. And mm -hmm. um, I made other movies, but nothing's quite like working at the Disney lot. The great people. Wow. And then um, what about, uh, let's step back a second. What about Fred McMurray? What, uh, what was he, what was he like? Cause I, I <coughs> I've talked with uh, Barry Livingston from my three sons and he's told me a bit about Fred, but, but uh, you had an interesting moment there in, in Fred's career, actually. What, what was he like then? Uh, again, here's another shy guy. 
we're talking about mm-hmm. Carson being shy and, and private. Yeah. Fred, Mc, Fred McMurray, the most unlikely guy to be in show business. I mean, he's not a, like Sammy Davis Jr., he's, he's not a showman, he's not a... Fred McMurray was a saxophone player, and somebody came up to him and said, would you like to audition for a thing? And he he said, well, I, 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 I guess I, I don't do impressions, but right. he said, yeah, I guess I would. Um, he said, I'm the most unlikely guy to be in this business. I, I talked to him while he was waiting to to uh, do his next shot in The Happiest Millionaire, yeah. do his close-up. And uh, I, and then I asked him, I was, I, when I, that's what was when I was sitting in for Johnny Carson a lot. And I said, would you be a guest on Carson for me? And he said, oh, no, John, I, I can't do that. I, he said, I just don't do, um, I don't play me very well. Oh, my God. And I, that's always stuck with me that I think one of the things that I've had to learn being shy myself was to, to play me, to figure out who I am. I mean, it's one thing to be a role in a movie or a, a TV series, but, but to figure out who John Davidson is and who, you know, so, so I, I've worked on being a good guest for Carson and Merv Griffin and Mike Douglas and all that. And I think you have to work on that. A lot of actors don't. Yeah. So that's, that's the sort of career that I wanted. And so I worked on trying to figure out who I am when I'm not playing any role but myself. Right. And uh, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. But yeah, Fred McMurray was an, another shy guy that, uh, that uh, Buddy Epson was the same way. I worked with him in Family Band. Um, really? Buddy was that way too? Yeah, very. He loved entertaining, loved playing the banjo and doing funny dancing and stuff. But you'd have to say that he was not socially free. He was freer when he was in movies and on stage. How and I think that's what brought me to the theater is that I found that I could be freer on stage and in movies than I was in real life. Wow. And uh, so that opened me up. I, I think theater, it does that for a lot of people. Even if you don't go into the theater, that's mm-hmm. why I think uh, theater arts and, and uh, is, is important to people, even if you're going to be an IBM executive. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's good. It's, it's role playing. Um, w- all of us are role playing, even if we're running a grocery store or a shoe store, or if we're, Whatever we do, uh, you are playing a role when you put on your hat and go to work. Yeah, I get it. And uh, that's an important it. that's an important thing to to learn. Yeah, no, that's a good one. I I agree. I I, I uh, I've done a lot of improv in my in my time, and I, I know that on a you're right. You can be an IBM executive, get them out there, do some improv, and suddenly they're able to light it up. You know, yeah. so you never know. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, the other one in that in that whole menagerie of like shows that you've been on was the Ed Sullivan show I saw. Um, that is another yeah. personality that I have heard like I, I don't know I have no real sense of Ed Sullivan. What, well, did, did you nobody, have nobody sense does. Of him? Nobody does. He was he was cardboard to, to me, uh, and but he was very nice. But uh, yeah, no nobody ever knew Ed Sullivan. He was he was a uh, he was a guy who was the host you know just you know there's no personal relationship at all i had trouble getting on ed sullivan show as many shows because i never had a hit record all right most people who do sullivan they come to it with some uh signature tune mm-hmm. you know please, please release me for engelbert tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree for tony orlando oh yeah definitely. everybody had a hit hit song i never had that i i never worked on getting a hit record i should have but I was in musicals playing other people. And, and when I got to variety television, I just was a singer on television. I, I, I was not a hit record person like Tony Orlando or Sonny and Cher. Or what. Um, so I had trouble getting on uh, Ed Sullivan at first. And then uh, they put me on and I was on two or three times and it was a thrill. Um, one time I followed a dancing bear uh, <laughs> next time it'd be following uh, uh, plate plate spinners or whatever, and you just come out and do your bit because it was done like a live show. You know, I, I think it was live, wasn't it live? 
Yeah, I think it was. I think, I think you might be right. I mean, I, I'll, I'll admit that's. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure on that one. Yeah. Wow, that's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I saw there was an article, and I'm not sure if it was the New York Times or New Yorker or one of them, but I thought it. You know, it was interesting. In that article, they said uh, the person like labeled you as a superstar. Time forgot, and and I really disagree with that. I really do, and I'm not just trying to butter you up. No, I mean this sincerely. John, you were a for, uh, you were a superstar. I mean, when I say you were on everything, you were on everything. And as an actor, um, you know, a musical artist, everything, you were out there. Not only that, you had your own variety show. So I don't know. I just want to throw that out there. I totally disagree with that. You can't get much bigger in the business no. than you were. And and I and you know and and really have continued that legacy. But what? Um, how did the John Davidson show come about? I mean, that's that's like an amazing feat that you got your own show. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, yes, and I'm very grateful. I, I, I've had great success. I don't mean to uh, to put it down, but I've never really, I've never really made it. I, I've never. <laughs> oh come on! I, no, no, no. I yes, yes. I was very big in the seventies and eighties late 60s 70s and 80s and uh but uh, yeah but uh i'm not i've never been hot i'm not like tom jones i'm not sexy i'm uh i'm just i'm a guy who gets the job done you want some yeah let's get davidson for that he he'll do it he'll do anything uh -huh. he's a whore I, i've been a whore i i, I take <laughs> I take sorry. Whatever those needs to words be done. don't go together well with John Davidson. Nice try. No, yeah. What? Uh, so how did the John Davidson show come about? Is that is that a Bob Banner move or what? What? How did that? How did that all come together? Now, are, are you talking about uh, the daytime show? I, 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 oh no, you that, had the variety show. You had the variety show. Well, I've had several. I, a lot of them have been summer replacements. I replaced Tom Jones. I replaced Andy Williams. I replaced Perry Coleman. Wow. Um, and it, the John Davidson show was a daytime talk show. Well, actually, it showed sometimes at night, whatever. It was a syndicated uh, uh, talk variety show. Right. Right at the end, when, when, when Talk Friday in the afternoon was going out until uh, mm -hmm. uh, who's the lady that brought back uh, variety daytime television before Ellen? Before oh, Ellen. Uh, Oprah? No, Oprah was more serious talk. Um, you know, the lady, oh. Uh, it, she was I'm in uh, Sleepless in Seattle. She was oh, oh, uh, wait. Well, no, Sleepless in Meg Ryan was, uh, yeah, no, uh, Sleepless. But the friend, the friend. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, oh, my gosh. I can't believe I don't know that. Off the top of my head, I can't, I just can't think. She was the host that brought back that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, when Oprah came in and Phil Donahue, that, that became right, serious right, talk. Right, right, right. So I was, when Mike Douglas was on, yes. that's the, that's the, they brought me in to replace him for two years, and that became the John Davidson show. I think you're referring to that. Yeah. Um, it, uh, they were, they were looking, uh, Westinghouse was looking for a guy to be like Mike Douglas, and I was pretty close. Um, and, uh, that was great for a couple of years, and uh, I got better at it. I, I, uh, I, I learned how to interview people, and and uh, um, when I when I got that, that meant that they didn't ask me to uh, to to be a guest on Carson uh, to be a guest host as much anymore. I don't know. It it came about because they were looking for someone to do that, and oh, Dick Clark and I were up for that together. And I think they felt that Dick Clark was maybe overexposed. He, he did so many shows. So uh, they asked me to do that. Dick Clark has been a good friend. I've always, I've always used Dick Clark as someone I would call and say, should I take this? Should I do this? Wow. Very, very, very honest. Very, very, uh, very real man, Dick Clark. He helped so many people. Very smart. Wow. I heard Mike, uh, Mike Douglas, wasn't that uh, happy about that. Is that, is that right. true? I heard he was actually right. kind of ticked off. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. He felt I stole his show. <clears throat> he felt that when his producer called my agent and said, we want John Davidson, that I should have called Mike and said, 
they're calling me. Should I take your show? <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's, that's not the way it works. And Mike Douglas was not very nice to me during that time. And mm -hmm. he was he was hurt. He felt rejected. And uh, as it turned out, he went on and did his show. But while I was doing my show, um, I don't know. It, it Yeah, he was not happy with me. Yeah. That, that's okay. It's, that's okay. Hey, can't can't yeah. please everybody. Yeah. What um the other the other thing that I mean I'm we're jumping in different areas and I and I hope you don't mind but I, you know these are things that intrigue me. Jerry Weintraub uh was your manager at one point and Jerry yes. Jerry Weintraub is kind of a legend in the business. I mean the people that he yeah. worked with. I mean you you were uh he didn't have like I mean he had like major clients and uh what was what was that experience like for you? working with him well i had a manager at the time and uh he uh saw me in las vegas at the hilton i, I played the elvis showroom for years and uh mm -hmm. he said uh, i think i can get you a better deal there would you sign with me and then we'll do and then my christmas specials i did three christmas specials that weintraub uh, uh negotiated and and then he negotiated the contract for that's incredible Oh, yeah, right. Um, that was uh, they did with Fran Tarkington and Kathy Lee for a year. That's incredible. Was how people knew me, not as a singer, but as a host. Oh, it's a massive and, uh, show. A mass, yeah. That was a top five show for five years. Um, yeah, he was great. He was a a powerhouse manager, um, powerful guy, really a a a, a mover and a shaker, and and uh, was great. Uh, he had Davidson, Denver, and Diamond. Wow! And I was the I was the bottom guy on the rung there, but Neil Diamond and Denver, so the, the three Ds, and uh, he did a lot for my career. He was just great. Um, he passed away just a couple of years ago. Right. Just a a power powerful man, a real a real deal maker, real matchmaker. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. I've had this. Um, oh right. Respiratory thing that I, so maybe we ought to kind of shoot. Should we end this up? Are we it? okay? Yeah, sure, uh, sure. Of course, of course, John. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I appreciate you even coming out uh, to do what what you did. Um, but I obviously would have loved to have, have asked you even more things. But maybe we can have you back. Maybe when you're feeling a little I'd, better. I'd love to come back when I feel better. I just I, uh, as I say, I've had this respiratory thing and I'm I'm not quite over it. So, but no, oh, I appreciate John, it, John. You're great. You are a real pro, man, and I enjoy talking to you. And I'd love to do it again. When okay. I feel better, would you would you have me back? I, John, I would have you back in a second. There's so many things I'd love to talk with you about, and and uh, it's been a, a complete pleasure. And thank you for being. It says so much about you anyway that you you come on the show a week after, you know, you weren't feeling well and you still want to be here. And and that I really I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart very much. Thanks, John. All the best to you. All I'll right. be watching you. Okay, I'll reach out and you are coming back on when you're feeling better. All right. Thanks, man. Okay. Thanks, man. Take care of yourself and have a great holiday, John. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, don't forget to hit the subscribe button in the corner of the video. And if you like the video, please hit the like button as well. And while you're here, take a look at some of the other great interviews from anybody from Jerry Mathers to Butch Patrick to Judy Norton. All fantastic. Have a great one.